He's cooked for us, he's cared for us, and he's pampered us for over 25 years with unparalleled customer service. Hi, I'm Ernie Manus. Coming up on interviews, our conversation with Jackson Hicks. Customer service still alive and well. Customer service is very alive and well. It's probably the most important part of the business proposition. Why do so many people lose sight of that, or forget it, or not pay attention to it? Oh, you know, Ernie, I think they just get focused on all the business details and counting the beans, and uh, you know, looking at sets of books. And uh, in my view, it really is all about taking care of your customer. You know. Why, in your view, how come it's something that you've paid attention to and haven't lost sight of? Well, I'm not sure exactly um, why I paid attention to it, except that I don't think you're really successful unless you do that. My, my clients want me to do that. They're, they recognize that, that taking care of them is the most important part of the business equation, so if I don't do that, I don't have any clients. Did you always know that that was something? Always. Always. I learned it at the feet of Stanley Marcus in the first month of my business career when I was a buyer trainee at Neiman Marcus in the late 60s. And to have an influence in your early business life like that that was so focused on customer service was a real blessing for me. Now, am I right to even start at that point? Is that what you think is the most important thing of a successful business? Um, you know, I think in our business, learning just the, to care about people and take care of them is, is the beginning point. And I probably learned that from my grandmothers who entertained a lot and they, they loved to have folks in their home. And it was always very important to them to make sure everyone was nurtured, and cared for and pampered. And so I learned that when I was five or six years old from them. And it, it uh, was really part of my sort of upbringing. And then when I got into a business environment, it was a natural thing to, as I discovered people that had a business perspective that included that, it was a very natural thing uh, for me to adopt that. Okay, story I heard, tell me if it's true or false. Your 13th birthday party, you planned it, invited the guest, and catered it yourself. <laughs> That's exactly right. It was... Uh, <laughs> In 1958, it was a Hawaiian luau. Now, <laughs> if you can imagine a Hawaiian luau in 1958 in my backyard in Oklahoma City, <laughs> complete with orchids and a pit dug for roasted pig, it was an interesting party. <laughs> <laughs> what made you think to do that? Why was that something you well, wanted to do? Well, you know, Hawaii was a big deal, you know, in the late <laughs> 50s. You know, we had all the beach songs, and you know. It, it, was a, it was a kick. So my parents always thought it was a great idea if we entertained at home. That kept us out of mischief. So they encouraged us to do that. But they also said, if you want to entertain at home, you have to plan it. You know, you have to raise the money to give the party. So I cut grass as a you know, summer job to get extra money, and I used that money to give my first party. <laughs> so this is something that's always been part of you. You've Absolutely. always wanted to do this. Absolutely. So then what brought you here to Houston? Well, I came to Texas to go to school at Baylor, and I was there uh, in the mid-60s, and then I wanted to stay in Texas. It's my adopted home after I left Oklahoma, and uh, Houston seemed to be such a vital business community and the kind of place that if you worked hard and, and were focused on a good idea, that people would recognize that, and I interviewed at Neiman Marcus, and uh, they thought I'd be a good match for them, and so I moved here, and then I've just stayed for 35 years. <laughs> You started at Neiman Marcus. Mm -hmm. You were working with the wines. You left Neiman's. Right. And you went to... Went to work with Richard's Wines and Spirits and was a buyer for them for about nine years before I started the catering business. And what was it that made you start that first job, that first catering job? And I, I remember hearing stories about it. How did it all launch? Well, you know, I think as I was in the wine and spirit and sort of specialty retail business, I got to know lots of the people that are now my clients. And at that particular time, there really wasn't a, a catering firm in Houston that attended to all of the details of catering. People would, oh, they'd call the country club to get some parkers and maybe a few extra waiters from the country club, and then they'd call Jamales on Kirby to get some food and have someone pick it up, and uh, they'd have to call their own florist and their own uh, 
piano player from down the street, and maybe they'd have their household cooks cook part of the food too. And it was all just sort of put together. And, and I thought that if someone could come in and take all of that burden from their shoulders and say, I'll coordinate all that for you. We'll make the food wonderful, but also we'll take care of all those other details that that would be well received. And I began to talk to my retail clients about that at Richard's, and they thought that was just such a great idea and said, hey, we'll support you if you do that. And uh, so we gave it a, a shot, and it was very well received from the beginning. If I remember correctly, your very first venture was for 200 people? That's right. I, well, actually, almost 300, as it turned out. We thought it was going to be 200, but 300 showed up. <laughs> How do you start so big? I mean, uh, most well, catering companies I know would start with, oh, well, we did this dinner for six, or we tried out 12, and then we did 14. Well, you know, before I started the catering business, I was giving parties at home for my friends for four and 500 people. So it was a little crowded because I didn't have a very big house. But, uh, <laughs> and I did that a couple of times a year for the first 10 years after I moved to Houston. And when I was at Baylor, I was always kind of the go-to guy if the faculty wanted to give a reception or a party or... There was some important musician in the city, and they were giving a recital, and there was a party afterward. They'd come to me and say, can you help us with the party? So it wasn't terribly new for me. I had been doing that avocationally as a, just a real interest area in, in loving to entertain my friends. And, and my friends encouraged me. They said, you do this so well. Why don't you do it you know, for a livelihood? Yeah. As you do it as a business and for the size and the scale you do it as, does it take the joy out of doing it for yourself anymore? Not at all. Really? I feel so lucky to be involved in something I get so much joy from. It gives me such pleasure to take care of people and see them smile. And, you know, if I'm taking care of 2,000 of them at the Playboy party, as we did last month, they're all smiling. And if I have a part in that, that, that that's just very rewarding for me. When you look at the parties you do, and I've, I've seen you in action, and you remain calm and you handle it, is that intentional or is that just the way you are? Is it something you work at? Well, I think it's something that's a learned skill. You know, my educational background is at least in part in performing arts and music. And I was a singer when I was a young fellow and, and sang in some fairly large venues at Jones Hall here in Houston, Carnegie Hall, and some other places. And part of that training was you're always a little bit nervous when you're a performer. And, and if you have a good teacher, they teach you how to relax in that kind of pressure and how to be at ease so that you don't make your audience nervous. And, um, you know, because you get up on stage and you forget a line in the song and you still got to go on and not uh, let the audience know you're sweating. So I think I learned to do that from a very early age, when I was 10 or 11 or 12 years old. And uh, you don't get much accomplished if you get rattled by the circumstances. You kind of have to keep your head about you. In our business, there are always things that are going to happen. You know, the the electricity goes off and the stove doesn't work or the lights go off or, you know, somebody bumps into a car outside. And you, those things will happen and they do happen at most parties and you just have to come up with a creative way to deal with them that um, keeps everyone relaxed and keeps you relaxed. Yeah. How separate are you from Jackson and Company? Not very separate. <laughs> I uh, start my days at about 6 o'clock uh, with a cup of coffee and my computer and parties in front of me to plan for the day and then start talking to our staff around 9 o'clock. And I usually, if I'm lucky, get to bed around midnight or 1 o'clock after the party's in. So I guess that six hours a night, I'm sort of separate. <laughs> <laughs> what is the secret then to the success you've had? There is no one else that comes close to your company. Yours is pretty much above everyone else. Why did you raise to that level? What was it that you do that nobody else has figured out? Well, I, th I think one of the things that we do is we try to be extremely reliable. I think people really buy freedom from us. You know, we do catering, but I don't really think that's what they buy. I think they, they want to purchase the ability not to worry about anything having to do with entertaining. They're already having friends that are coming or important business associates, and uh, they're trying to get dressed or get their house or their business in order, they don't want to worry about it. Is the food going to get there on time? Is the food going to be hot if it's supposed to be? Will the musician show up? Will the valet parker show up? So we try to take all of that burden from their shoulders and make sure we're the person that's got the checklist on our clipboard and we're making sure it all happens on their behalf. So I think that reliability and that we do that very consistently, day in and day out, um, for seven or 800 parties a year, 
uh, and we've done that for 25 years, and we know how to do it well, and we know how to double net, sort of, and watch for the things that might happen and so that they don't happen if they all impact the party in a negative way. Um, I think also that people just appreciate being pampered. For me, it's not enough just to take care of people. Uh, if they have to ask for it at a table or if they have to ask for a drink, then I somehow have made a mistake. We should notice they need it beforehand. Yeah. Uh, Great service, I think, is anticipating need, not just going to fetch something after someone asks for it. Uh, I think that focus is fairly unique. There was stories of a uh, mimeographed booklet that each of your wait staff get. Do they still get those? Do they change from event to event? They do. You'll be happy to know that we've moved from the mimeograph machine <laughs> <laughs> to computer-generated documents. Uh, it's grown to about a 200-page document now, and uh, it's sort of a compilation of our 25 years of history. Part of it has to do with my thoughts, part of it wait staff insights about how to do things in an effective way. Some of it's uh, uh, insights that clients have given me about how we can serve them better. And it's sort of a, uh, we, we sort of call it the Bible of catering wisdom. <laughs> it, floor plans of the place that you're going to be at, are those still included? Things oh, like sure. That? We do floor plans of almost every large event that we do to scale so that we know exactly how much room there is between the tables and how much. It's kind of a bad thing if you plan dinner for a thousand people and only 800 will fit in the room. It, you want to discover that before the dinner, not after. <laughs> Brings up a good point. Advice you'd give to people who want to throw some event. What are the biggest mistakes people make? Well, I think probably the, the, the most difficult thing about giving a party is making the guest list. So I think that you need to be sure as a host that you think carefully about who you're going to invite. Will there be, you, know, you want to have people that have uh, congeniality, but also a little bit of conflict now and then, you know, the spur conversation, they want everyone to be exactly the same. Uh, so I think uh, that's certainly one issue. I think another thing that people should address when they begin to entertain is to think about their budgets. I think frequently folks are afraid to talk about that, and, mm -hmm. and that's just silly. We all have budgets, and we all know, you know sort of how much we'd like to spend on various parts of our lives. And I think to be frank and open about that, that helps the professional team that you may have uh, serve you better because then they can help the party conform to your budgetary guidelines. Has it been too long since you've been able to pull together a party on a shoestring? Can Jackson do that anymore? Absolutely, I can do that. Do you enjoy it? I do enjoy it. I think that's a fun challenge, actually. If someone says, I, well, I have a modest amount to spend, but it's still reasonably enough to do the party, and they say, how can I get the best value for this investment I want to make in entertaining? I find that just really rewarding to tell them how I think they can sort of get the most bang for their bucks. Do you approach doing an event for, and you've done it for the Queen of England, any differently than you would for a couple's wedding reception? I think essentially not, because if you're doing a party for Queen Elizabeth or a new bride, you basically want to know what their values are and what will make them happy and what their interests are and what their favorite drink is and you know what their favorite colors are and and what's important to them, because I see my job is, as, is in part figuring out what's important to them and what will make them feel free and happy and have a great time and then delivering on that. And I don't think that that's any different doing that for the President of the United States, the Queen of England, or a new bride. Yeah. Now, I know that you don't like to tell tales of clients, that there's a certain confidentiality that goes with it. But mm -hmm. when you think of certain people, if I can ask you some, I'm curious what comes to mind. If I say Queen Elizabeth, what do you think of? Um, I think the first thing was that she carries a little purse hanger with her that she clips onto the side of the table. So she, you know, she has those bags that have straps <laughs> on them. She always hangs it right there so it's close by and she doesn't have to bend over to get it. <laughs> <laughs> do you have any idea what's in it? Uh, I, I suspect very little. Probably not money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Barbara Bush. Um, first thing that comes to my mind with Mrs. Bush is that she's terribly gracious. And she is always concerned about making people around her feel comfortable. Um, she also has very high standards. She expects us when we're helping her to take good care of her friends. Yeah. And we enjoy doing that. Lynn Wyatt. Great style. Uh, 
think she has a remarkable taste and elegance and represents uh, when, when I travel and, and I mentioned Lynn's name, you know, people's eyes light up. You know, <laughs> she's so recognized all over the world as being a person of great style. Yeah. Are there certain ones that when you meet them to work with them, you just get that thrill, that chill, or have you been doing it long enough that it's a job? You know, when, when people come to me and they trust me to help them with a the party, I find that just so flattering and exciting. I, it really doesn't make any difference if they're well-known or important or it's someone doing their first party. So I get a big charge out of that, and I, I really want to take particularly good care of them. And so in some ways, my most exciting party is my next party. Yeah. I, I've heard you say that before. I've seen things where you talk about the parties you've done. The question that comes to my mind, have you ever thrown what you think in your mind was the perfect party. And the reason I ask that is I get the feeling you're always thinking about what could have been different, what you could have improved on and applying it to the next one. Looking back, has the perfect party happened? No, I think I've had some perfect moments here and there in parties. But I, you know, as a whole, I'm still looking for the perfect party. I hope someday uh, you know, I'll get there. But that, that's, uh, that's, I, that's my idealism. I'm such a perfectionist right. that really finding the perfect party is... It's maybe a, a goal that's beyond the horizon. If you had it, would that be it? Could you then say, all right, I'm done, I've, I've gotten to where I'm going, or no? I think if I ever really had it, um, I'd probably say that's the end of that chapter and look for the next one. <laughs> Talking about chapters ending now, Aramark and Jackson and & Company have come mm-hmm. together. Right. Jackson & Company is going national more so than even before. What does that mean for you? Well, it's exciting to be a part of such an extraordinary team. Aramark is the, one of the largest food service companies in the United States, and their emphasis has been in sort of large venues like stadiums and convention centers and performing arts centers, among other things. Uh, and they've not really had a presence in the fine dining off-premise catering business. And they began to talk to us several years ago to explore the opportunities of us working together in that regard. And they're very excited about developing a national presence in that market, and they think what we do, we do well, and they want to uh, learn something about what we do, and they have wonderful uh, people to work with, great financial strength, wonderful business experience, uh, and far-reaching, and they have 250,000 employees in 18 countries, so uh, that, that's pretty exciting. It's a much broader palette for us to to work with than we have had before. So what will Jackson & Company be then? Will you still be helming it for how long? How does all of that play in? Well, I'm still the CEO of Jackson & Company uh, in Houston. We'll continue to be, enjoy being. I don't want to go anywhere. I love what I do. Uh, Aramark's beginning to send some people to Houston to work with us to learn a bit more about what we do, and I'm traveling a little bit more. But my real focus is, is going to be on my Texas clients and my Houston clients as we continue to grow that model, and I think, you know, in future years, perhaps in five or six or seven years, I may spend more time in the national market, but certainly in the near future, I'm just going to be doing what I've always done. Is that thrilling to you or kind of scary, or both? I think it's challenging. It's interesting. You know, I've done this for 25 years, and I, as I said, I still enjoy it. I find every day exciting and interesting. But I think having the opportunity to go to another city and, and, and develop our model there. I think what we, what we offer Houstonians is fairly unusual and unique in the catering world. And um, I think our attention to detail is, is fairly precise and our focus on customer service is pretty precise and our compulsiveness about quality. And, and so to be able to take that value system to a city that perhaps hasn't experienced it in quite the same way mm-hmm. and, and share that vision with staff and waiters and let clients experience that that perhaps never have experienced that before is very exciting and we've had some opportunity to do that you know we we've done the olympic games in calgary we've been all over the united states and i find when we do that that we meet new people who are excited to learn what we can bring to their entertaining life and and it's different than our Houston clients who've become accustomed to what we do, and I think they enjoy it, but they have already very high expectations for us to stay really on top of our game. So when we go to another city and meet new people, they're very excited about what we do. Now, have you catered in the White House? Not actually in the White House. The White House has their own food service staff, uh, and the Navy stewards take care of all the interior White House 
uh, food service, but we've catered for every living president at one time or another, some of them many times. Yeah, when, and the reason I bring up the White House is the same thing with Aramark, owned a lot of facilities where you can't get into, and now being united with them though, Jackson and Company can go in there? Well, I think we'll have a little more access. You know, that a lot of their contracts with their big facilities are with the particular facility, and so sometimes that may be a bit more available to us and sometimes not. Uh, but I think Aramark's goal, like mine, is to serve our clients, so I think we're going to try to find opportunities to do that. Okay, now let's go into a personal world for a minute here. Sure. What do you do to unwind? If you're working that many hours, do you get away? Can you escape? Well, I enjoy traveling, and I try to do as much of that as I can. Uh, I like spoiling myself as much as I like spoiling my clients, <laughs> almost. So I like to go to good restaurants and good hotels and do that. Uh, I sometimes late at night just come back and sit down and play the piano for an hour or so at one in the morning. I still enjoy doing that. I love reading. One of my great relaxations is playing with my two English Cocker Spaniels yeah. who are terrifically affectionate and thankfully for the moment quiet. <laughs> <laughs> when you look out in your life and you look at all of the people you've met and the things you've done, what do you come away with? Um, I think I come away with just feeling really lucky, Ernie. You know, it's, I, I feel so fortunate to live in a state and a city where I can practice my profession and, and, and people seem to enjoy what I do, and that's so satisfying uh, to me. I think many people go through life just working to sort of put bread on the table and a roof over their head without really experiencing, this, experiencing the same kind of joy that I do. Mm -hmm. uh, I am excited every day about taking care of people and making wonderful parties for them. Is there any job or anything you'll shy away from, or are all of them a new thrill and exciting? Well, I like challenges, so I tend not to shy away from many challenges. Um, however, I have sometimes told a potential client they might be happier with another caterer uh, if I think they're not focused on quality. Um, that's really what we do. You know, I'm pretty compulsive about the, the quality of our work and our attention to detail and, the, and the, the values I have about service. So if somebody says to me, oh, well, I don't care if my guests are well taken care of. I only need one bar, and I think they need three to take care of their guests, I probably will head in a different direction. Yeah. You said earlier about there haven't been perfect parties, but there have been perfect moments. What would make a perfect moment? You know, I think... Um, Frequently, it has to do with having exactly the right guest around you at a party that, that create a sort of energy and magic that you don't get from anything else. I mean, food helps contribute to that, good service contributes to that, but having wonderful people that are enjoying each other, I think, can create magic moments. I also think music is extremely important and entertaining. Um, I did a party here at the house, oh a few months ago and uh, had a, a favorite gospel singer uh, of mine sing here and it was just magic, you know, and everybody was sort of on the same vibe and they'd had certainly good things to eat and drink, but it was, it was more about the congeniality of being together in an, in an environment they felt really pampered in and then having beautiful music and fun people around them. Is there anything that you know that other people don't know or is it just that you pay attention to what everyone should be paying attention to? Oh, gee, I don't know if I'd take the step to say I know anything anyone else doesn't know. Uh, I think there are a long list of things that I know about what my clients would like for me to t do for them. And I try to pay particularly close attention to all of those things at one time. Uh, and I think it's sort of the combination of those things and that constant attention to detail that perhaps sets us a bit apart. True or false, you keep a Rolodex on people, keep cards on people to know what are their favorite drinks, what they do, what they like. Well, uh, that is true. Uh, I keep a lot of it in my head uh, as much as I can, but we have so many clients and friends and people that we've encountered over the years that I try to make pretty extensive notes. Uh, I used to do it in my Rolodex. I now do it in my Palm Pilot <laughs> and on my laptop. Uh, but if we're doing a party and I'm looking over a guest list and I, it may, I may remember that someone had a special drink that they liked and sometimes I may remember exactly what it was and how they liked their martini shaken or stirred and or olive or onion. Uh, 
I may not, and I can frequently find that in my notes. And, yeah. uh, you know, I, th the reason I, I keep up with that is because I just think that makes people feel more special. You know, if, uh, if you paid enough attention to remember something that's unique and special about their needs, wants, desires, then I, make, I think that makes them feel important, and, and that's part of my value system, that they should feel important if they're one of our guests. One thing I don't want to forget to do before we run out of time, which we just about have, is how you choose to give back to the community. And you do a lot of that, too. How do you decide what you endorse and what you support? Well, you know, I think Houston, um, fortunately for all of us that live here, is one of the most philanthropic giving cities in the nation. When I travel around and, and I talk to people about the amount of money that's raised here for good causes, they're just astounded about what we do. And I think this city has been very good to me, so it's a great pleasure to support causes that I feel are worthwhile. And it's hard because there are a lot of good causes here. I think, first of all, we try to support the things that our clients are interested in and, mm -hmm. and the things that they feel are important because they frequently have supported us and we want to return to causes they think are important. Um, and then I also try to look for things that perhaps don't have quite as much support that I think are quite worthwhile, small projects. Uh, that may not have gotten the public attention yet, uh, and we can bring our resources to bear to help help them do good work and grow. And, and sometimes in the early years of those projects, we will support their events pretty much totally until they get on their feet and can, and can raise money a bit better. Well, Jackson, I don't know how to thank you enough for sitting down and talking with us, and I'm very happy to hear we've got many more years of Jackson and company going on. Thanks, Ernie. It's been a pleasure. Jackson Hicks. Mm -hmm.